souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, there the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Praise forever to the King of kings. Come, let us adore. I was practicing this morning, so.
Well, good morning, church. We're so glad that you have made it a part of your morning to be here. Whether you're here in person, which we are so glad to see you, and if you joined us online this morning, we so are so glad that you are here. As we go into our second week of Advent, uh, the Skaggs family here is going to lead us in uh, our reading and lighting of our Advent candle. The second Sunday of Advent signifies love. And it reminds us that Jesus was sent to us because of God's love for us. John 3, 16. For God loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Amen, church. Let's stand together. We have a lot to praise this morning. We have a lot to sing about. And we want to sing this morning about our God, how he chose this morning to go not the world lead over us, but to be with us. darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is either awesome and darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. This morning, we are excited to sing about our God. He has come to be with us. That's what we lift up this morning. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand again? Then what can stand again? This voice is our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than it. Awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is either awesome in power, our God, our God. 
give God a cup of praise this morning. Amen. This morning we see God because he sees us. He knows your name.
morning we continue to sing about our King, the King of Kings, the Lord with us. praise this morning. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, praise
be in this place among us, with us, Emmanuel. We love you. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's so good to worship with you this morning. Thank you, um, Brother Mark and band, for leading us in a wonderful time of worship. Brother Josh is uh, out today just in an abundance of caution, uh, as many are having to, to stay away right, right now. But we appreciate uh, the wonderful time of worship that we had. Those of you that are worshiping with us online, we are glad that you're here, glad you continue to tune in, take time to worship the Lord in your week. I'm going to plant some seeds this morning. You may be thinking, well, Brother Mike, it's a little late in the year, a little nippy outside to be planting seeds but that's all right because I'm going to plant them inside. I'm going to plant some seeds in our souls today. You know, our, our souls are our mind where we think, our heart where we feel our emotions, but also our will where we make decisions of what we're going to do. And the type of seed that I want to sow today is the one that is mentioned in the lighting of the second candle of our Advent wreath, the seed of love, as it is described in the Word of God. And I want to show you, maybe for some of you, just remind you of the fruit that is produced in our lives when love is sown. And when the seed of love is allowed to grow in our hearts, when it's, when it's nurtured and matured, what fruit it can produce in us. And for each example I'm going to bring to you, I'll take you to a different text, all closely related to the Christmas story. The first example is God himself. Now, of course, with God, no outsider had to plant the seed of love in his heart. Love is so much a part of God's nature and person that the scripture says God is love. Love is innate within God. Nevertheless, even though it is an innate part of the person and character of God, did you ever think Love still produces fruit in God's activity, in God's words, in God's purpose. In fact, in the most familiar verse of Scripture, uh, the one that was read as a part of the lighting of the candle for us this morning, John 3, 16, slow down as you think about it a minute. For God so loved the world that that means the love that was brewing in God's heart had a consequence it led to something it caused God to do something God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Folks, I'm telling you the love that is in the heart and person and life of God is the whole reason we have Christmas. We would not have Christmas. There would be no Savior sent to us. There would be no Messiah. There would, would be no reason to celebrate at all if the love of God had not moved him 
to send the Savior, to send the Lord Jesus Christ to us. It was the love of God that moved God to actually send his son, to send Jesus to come to the earth, to pay the penalty for our sin upon the cross. You know, I cannot even imagine the depth of a love that would call someone to send his own son to die for someone else. I can comprehend someone having a love great enough to give their own life for someone, but to send one's own son, one's own child to come and to bear our sins. If God had not been so much love, if the seed of love inside of God had not borne so much fruit, we would not have Christmas to celebrate. The love of God motivated God to accept the Son as our substitute, to accept His death upon the cross, to pay the price for my sins and for your sins. For in the fruit of love, and I want you to be thinking about the fruit of love because as the seed of love has already, I'm sure, many times across the years been sown in your hearts, but as it is sown again in your heart, I want you to be thinking about what love can produce. And so consider what it produced in, in God. It produced mercy and grace. It produced forgiveness and redemption. You have a hard time sometimes forgiving someone who sinned against you. Someone who's, who's spoken ill to you or spoken ill uh, about you, maybe behind your back, but you, you learned about it and you're just having a hard time forgiving that person. Forgiveness is a fruit of love. And so the, the problem is not so much, well, I just can't quite get a handle on this forgiveness thing. The problem is that love has not produced that fruit in you. We see even in God that the love innate within the person of the Father is what produces forgiveness and redemption, produces salvation and adoption, bringing us into his family. It produces provision, God's provision for all of his children and his provision for all the people of the earth, even those who have not yet come to faith in him and his care. Another fruit of love for the Father is instruction and guidance that he wants to direct our paths, show us the way in which we should go. I will tell you, the love of God is so great that it is virtually indescribable. Just over a hundred years ago, a man by the name of Frederick Lehman wrote these words. Could we with ink the oceans fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky the sky. How great, how marvelous, how indescribably extensive is the love of God. My friend, as Christmas is all around us throughout the, the next several weeks, let everything that we see remind us not only of the hope that we have as we trust in Christ, but let it remind us of the love that motivated God to send Jesus to come to us to be our Savior and to bear our sin upon the cross. And then let it raise the question in us, how is the seed of love growing in my own life? Is, is love maturing? Is it producing more and more fruit within me? Not only for me to notice, but for others around me to notice. 
We also see the fruit of love in the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, Mary was a a young woman who truly loved God. God loved her first, of course, as God loves all of us first. But Mary, even as as a young teenager, had a tremendous, deep, abiding love for God. When we read about her in the scripture, she is probably around 16 or 17 years old. Young people think about that. Some of you are are that age or just past it. Some are approaching that, that age. And see how already in her life, at that age, the fruit of love had produced many things in Mary's life. Let me just mention the first three, and then I'm going to go to the text and show you these things in her life. But the first thing that it produced in Mary's life is love produced reverence. Reverence means to honor. It produced reverence for God that Mary honored God. She revered him. She highly valued him. She exalted God. The second thing that love produced in Mary's life was humility. It wasn't all about Mary. In fact, what we read about Mary is is it practically was not about Mary at all. I mean, there was just no self-focus in her life. She was humble. She looked upon what God had done in and around her life that had brought many blessings to her. And then it brought gratitude I know that we're just coming out of uh, Thanksgiving, and hopefully Thanksgiving was a time that we reflected on the blessings and goodness of God. But my friend, gratitude is not something for us just to experience or just to express one time a year or just on special occasions. God's blessings are overflowing to us every, every week, every day, every hour. Think about the good things in your life. Think about the things that that you just like, that, that you are just glad are part of your life. Do you know every one of those things the scripture says has come to you and has come to me as a gift from God, as a gift from the Father of lights in whom there's no shadow of turning. That means that he's not different each day. But every day he loves us. Every day he showers us with blessings. And we should be the ones who are grateful. Noticing the blessings that he sends to our life. Now, I want you to see those things in Mary's life. In Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39, we read just a little segment. But it will give us a a peek into the heart into the soul of Mary and we're going to see how love produced reverence and humility and gratitude in this young lady. The scripture says now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She begins with reverence. Reverence for God is just the overflow of her heart. She said, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. She said, I just couldn't be lower. I am just the servant of the Lord. Mary was so humble and grateful. She said, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his maiden servant. For behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. We're going to talk about some of the conflict that was in Mary's life because of this news. But 
at this point that we're, we're reading, she has already wrestled with that and reconciled that. But she's saying, what's going to happen, what is happening in my life, as difficult as it is, the consequences that it brings, the generations after me are going to look back and call me blessed because, not because of what I am, not because of who I am, but because of what God has done in my life. She was filled with gratitude. And then she turns back to reverence. And she finishes this saying with, and holy is his name. Reverence, humility, gratitude, but not just that. Love growing in her heart also produced faith. Faith. Mary was a young woman who believed God. She was a young woman who believed his word. She believed what it said. Listen, when Gabriel walked into the, the room, came into the room where Mary was, Mary's first reaction wasn't, wait a minute, I don't believe in angels. No, Mary did believe in angels. She had never seen an angel. She had never met an angel, never heard from an angel. But she believed in angels because she believed the word of God. She believed the word of God because she believed God. That was the outflow of love in her own life. And then when the angel said, and now the Savior, the Messiah, is going to, be, is going to come in the world through you, Hey, the talk of Messiah also wasn't strange. Mary believed Messiah was coming. She didn't know when. She didn't know exactly how. And, and the way the angel was going to tell her that this was going to happen was going to be a surprise with which she would have to wrestle. But the point is, there was no question that God was going to keep his word one day, that Messiah was going to come Mary's faith had already been built to that point. Here she is, 16, 17-year-old young lady, and yet she has a great confidence in God. She has a strong belief in his word. And what he has caused to be written in his word, she believes in her heart and her life. It's affected her mind, the way that she receives the news. It has affected her will and prepared her to respond to the Lord because she has allowed love to bear fruit in her life. And one of the fruits that love bears is faith. Let me tell you something. Sometime when you struggle believing something, Maybe it's something that you've heard for a long time, but you've just not, you know, from God's word, but you've just not settled into it to say, I really believe that. Whenever it comes up, you, you think, eh, I'm, still, I'm still thinking about that one. I'm not, I'm not real sure I believe that. Or, or maybe it's something new. Someone reads a portion of the word and you hear it or you encounter it when you're reading the word and it's new. And you think, mm, I'm not to think about that. I'm not sure about that. You know, the problem there is not that the concept that you're struggling with is so difficult. The concept, it's not that the concept is unbelievable. It's that there hasn't been the preparation in your mind and in your feelings and in the will that love produces as it grows to maturity so that you have prepared yourself to respond in faith. So that when you hear the word of the Lord, your inclination is not to doubt or to question, but your inclination is to believe. And I'm telling you, that's what Mary's inclination was like. It's not that all this was not a great surprise to Mary, it, but it was that love had already produced not only reverence and humility and gratitude in her life, it had also produced faith. Loving God leads us to believe his word. And likewise, believing his word leads us to love God more. 
The next thing that we see in Mary's life that love produced was obedience. Mary was committed to do what God told her to do. In Luke 138, it says, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Now, folks, let, let me tell you, Mary was full aware from the first time she heard Gabriel say that she was going to bear the son. Even though he explained, I know you're a virgin. This child is going to be produced by God doing a miraculous work inside of you. But Mary knew how people were going to react. Her culture was very different than ours. Now, I know we live in a culture where men and women sleep together, even live together without the benefit of being in the covenant of marriage. And today in our culture, there is even little social stigma about that. I just want you to understand Mary's culture wasn't that way. Not that that did not, not happen. It happened. But among her culture, which was the God-fearing Jews, marriage was still held in very high regard. They still uh, were faithful to the marriage covenant. And so adultery and fornication, while they still happened even among the, the Jewish people, they were not accepted. It did not happen broadly so that there had become kind of a, a cultural quiet about it that just, just said, well, it's no big deal. That's not how and where Mary lived. And, and Mary lived in a small town. Now, I don't know how many of you, you know, have ever lived in a, a small town. Frankly, I never have. I've always lived uh, in, a, in a city, so I've not experienced this myself, but I've known a number of people that have who have talked about how different the culture can be in a, in a small town. Mary's town was Nazareth less than 400 people. And Mary knew that when the word got out that she was, was pregnant, that it would spread through that town like wildfire. Mary knew this was going to bring problems between her and her parents, at least until they came to a point to understand the, the word that God had sent and to believe her that God was doing a great miracle in her life. Initially, it was going to bring problems. It was going to bring conflict and hardship. She knew it was going to bring problems with her friends because her friends were also a part of this culture that honored marriage. And, and most of her friends, maybe all of her friends, were, were guarding their own purity uh, for the time in which they were married. And so all of a sudden for Mary, uh, while still betrothed to Joseph, all of her friends would assume that either Joseph had gotten her pregnant or somebody else, God forbid, had gotten her pregnant while she was betrothed to Joseph. But she was going to lose friends, maybe every friend, over this. And virtually the whole community would just sit in silent judgment of her, most of them not knowing, never believing the truth. Mary knew all of that. And yet, do you notice she didn't even pause to think about it? How could she be so ready to walk in obedience down a path so difficult, so challenging, which for her life, such long-term results? Because the love that she allowed, the love of God that she allowed to grow from a tiny seed into something that was thriving and abounding in her heart had not only produced reverence for God and a humility in her, in her own life, it had also produced faith and now it produced obedience. So when she was confident, yes, this is an angel, just like the word says, angels come. This is an angel who has brought to me the word of the Lord, consistent with all that I've read and all that I've been taught in the scriptures that Messiah is going to, to come quickly. She was ready, ready to walk in obedience. And she said, 
let it be to me according to your word. Friend, this is our time. With all the Christmas things uh, around us, we ought to be checking our own life. Are we filled with reverence? Or do we often use the name of God or the name of the Lord Jesus in vain? Maybe in a moment of anger or a moment of surprise. Maybe because we've allowed the, the way that we uh, hear our culture talking impact our own minds and our own will. And at least at times we speak just like lost people do taking lightly the name of God? Or do we talk about the man upstairs rather than talking about God with all reverence and honor and exaltation? Do we live lives of gratitude, thanking God every day, sometimes many times a day for the blessings he brings in our life? Do we allow love to nurture our faith so we, we have a mind to believe, we want to believe, as soon as we read something in the Word of God, even if we don't understand it, even if it challenges our comprehension and we say, I don't understand how it can be that way, we have a desire to believe it. We want to believe it because it's God's Word. And then we study enough that we can figure out how we know it is true. And then do we walk in obedience? Now listen, all of us have points of obedience. And all of us have points of disobedience. We're all together in that. The question is, which one dominates in your life? Is obedience the rule for you? Is that what usually happens? When you, when you think about something that you know the Lord wants you to do because you've been taught that from the Word, or you discover something new that you know the Lord wants you to do, does that usually result in obedience in your life or disobedience? Is obedience the rule and disobedience the exception that happens occasionally and when it happens you know, you come to a point of repentance and you, you turn your disobedience back into obedience. Or is disobedience the rule? That usually you're not doing what you know the Lord wants you to do and what the Lord tells you to do, but occasionally you get it right. And obedience becomes the exception. I'm saying all of these things are, are the result. They're the fruit of love growing in our heart. And, and I'm wanting to plant seeds of the love of God in your life. Not that they've not ever been planted before, but to, to plant more. To plant more and allow them to grow and be nurtured in you to produce these things. And we can tell that they're growing by seeing if these fruits are produced in us. Another example of the fruit of, of love we see being produced in Joseph's life, the adoptive father of Jesus. Joseph was a young man who loved the Lord, and his love for the Lord produced great fruit. It produced purity in his life. In Matthew 1, 18, Matthew 1 kind of tells us more about Joseph. And in verse 1, 18, it says of, of Joseph and Mary, before they came together. Folks, not only was Mary pure, Joseph was pure. Here was a, a young man, Joseph was probably 17 or, or 18 years old. But Joseph was a young man who had decided that purity was important for him. He not only wanted a bride who was, was pure... He was going to be a man who honored the Lord and was pure himself. And he was a just man. Verse 19 says of Joseph being a just man. In other words, righteousness and, and honesty and integrity, justice was important to him. The same verse, verse 19, shows us that Joseph was a most unusual man. Listen up, young men. Listen to this. This is an unusual quality 
to be found in a young man in the teen years. But it was found in Joseph and it can be found in you. And that is mercy. Mercy. You see, Joseph was just when he learned that Mary was pregnant and before he understood, before he came to the point to understand that Mary was still a virgin, that she had done nothing wrong. She had not violated her own purity, but that this was a miracle that God was doing once in an entire universe of time. Before he understood that, (coughs) excuse me, Joseph just thought Mary had gotten pregnant as women get pregnant. He knew he had kept himself pure. So the only thing that could possibly have happened as far as what Joseph could think about was that Mary betrothed to him, you know, had cheated on him. She had betrayed him. She had broken their betrothal. And so Joseph was saying the betrothal is is over. He was a just man. But then it says, and not wanting to make her, not wanting to make Mary a public example. You see, Joseph had the right legally to kind of put Mary before the whole city for the betrayal that she had committed because she had broken her vows to him. But Joseph was a young man of mercy. He was just. He knew right from wrong. He wasn't saying what Mary did was okay when he thought that she had had broken her, her vows and gotten pregnant. He was a just man. But then he didn't want the worst for Mary. He didn't want to put her up as an example. He had mercy upon her. And mercy is a fruit of love. Now, I mentioned these these ways, seeing them in the in the life of Joseph and, and young men, I call this to, to your attention because I'm telling you to be a young man like Joseph, where the seed of love has really produced fruit in your life, demands courage. It requires an outstanding young man who is willing to be courageous contrary to the times in which he lives and most of the other young men who are around him. You let the seed of God's love produce its fruit in your heart and help you keep yourself pure to honor the Lord to be a young man who believes and stands for right and wrong, a man of justice, and also be a man of mercy. You'll be a man of courage, and you will be unusual, one who stands out in the midst of the crowd. But Joseph also was a man of faith. He believed the word of the Lord. He was a man of obedience. And after the angel explained what was really happening and and that Mary was still a virgin and this was the the son of God, but he was to to maintain uh, holding off in their relationship until she gave birth to this child. Joseph also, just like Mary, immediately said, I'll do it. I'll take Mary to be my wife, but I'll keep her pure. Until she brings forth this son that God has sent through her. The fruit of the love of God maturing in his life. You know, of all these fruits that we see, let me tell you the one that that God points out, the one that Jesus himself points out, is the one to keep your eye on the very most, is obedience. You know why? Why? Because you can fake the others. You know, you, you, can, you can fake the, the, the humility. You can, can fake gratitude. You can even fake purity to most people because most people don't know you that well. You can fake being a person of justice. But you can't fake obedience. You can't can't hide from yourself what you do. You see yourself. You know what you do. You know whether you did what the 
the Lord said to do. And others see. Others may not can see in your heart. They may not know those other things. But they can see what you do. And so Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. (laughs) It shows an obedience. So when we really want to check our lives to see whether fruit, uh, love is producing its fruit in us. Obedience is the best place to check. Finally, the last example and the greatest example is Jesus himself. Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Friend, let me tell you, every moment of every day in Jesus' life revealed the fruit of his own love for the Father And his love for us. It it revealed it in his obedience. Jesus said that's the test. Jesus passed that test. You know that? Because he only did what the father showed him to do. He only said what the father gave him to say. And he lived his entire life without sin. Even to death on the cross. In addition to being good and kind and merciful and caring and compassionate and generous and selfless and self-sacrificing, all of those things Jesus was, my friend, oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Messiah to bring us the ability to enter into God's family and into God's kingdom. Have you trusted him? Is he your savior? Have you turned your life over to him and invited him to become the Lord, the master, the boss of your own life? That's what it means to be saved and to trust in him. If not in a moment when we pray, you can just pray your own prayer and tell the Lord that you believe he died on the cross for you. You believe he rose from the dead. Repent of your sins and ask him to come and live inside of your life and rule over you to become like we we sang, the king of your life, to be the king of kings in your heart and your life. And you can do that right where you stand in a moment when we pray. But I want to say to all of us who have trusted the Lord, when you think about the way that love was demonstrated in Jesus' own life and his obedience and faithfulness, goodness and kindness and mercy, the way he cared, the way he was compassionate for people, his generosity, his selflessness. Is that what people think when they think of you? That's what they thought when they thought of Jesus. Because love produced those fruits in his life. And so we can think of those fruits and ask, is that what people see in me? If not, we need to let the seed of love grow more. How do we do that? We water the seed with the word of God by reading it, by studying it, by meditating on it. We fertilize the seed in worship, not just by attending worship, but by entering wholeheartedly into worship, expressing our adoration to the Lord with voices lifted high and loud, singing out our praise and our thanksgiving, with just expressing to God how we feel about him to show our adoration as if it were just us and him present in the room. And as we water and fertilize the seed of God's love, it will produce fruit within us. Stand with me. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for anyone here who has not yet trusted the Lord Jesus. 
that today, Spirit of God, that you would speak to their heart and bring them to the place to say, I believe and I want to put my trust in you. And even now, if you're one of those people and you're wanting to trust him, just tell him you believe in him. Tell him you believe he died for your sin. Tell him you believe that he rose from the dead. Repent of your sins. Tell him you're sorry. You turn away from them. And then ask him to come into your life. Ask him to be the Lord, the master of your life. Tell him you want to follow and obey him from now on. And Father, for all of us who have trusted you, we do trust you. Spirit of God, would you enable us to see truly what fruits and how much of those fruits of love have been developed in our life across the years? And would you enable us, empower us, God, to water the seeds of love that they may grow to fertilize them through our worship that they may expand and dominate us. That when people call our name, they think about the fruits of love that are manifested in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Let's continue our worship this morning. Come to Jesus just as we are.
as I am. Just as I am, I would be lost, but mercy and grace, my freedom call, and now to the glory in your cross. Oh. to enjoy eating it means to talk with your hands it means it means taking time to get to know somebody it, it means to be a part of a family it's more about the importance of the relationship it's more about the importance of caring about the person that you've just spent the last two or three hours with and not wanting that to end are your kids american or italian <laughs> they are not totally american and they're not totally italian they're a mixture of both of them English is different their first language, but Italian is different their first culture. Cavallo, fatto di legno, benissimo. They go to Italian schools. Their friends are Italian. They they attend church in Italian. They go play in Italian. They go to swim class in Italian. Um, our neighbors, all Italian, and so they know how to, you know, be Italian in our Italian world. I think it's very important as uh, missionaries, as international workers, that we become part of the culture. We'll never truly be Italian, and that we'll never be Italian. We understand that. But it's important for us to engage and be a part of the culture. You know, we're there to love the people of Italy, and we can't love the people of Italy if we don't know the people of Italy. Why are you in Italy? We're in Italy because we love people. It's not just a calling to be there, it's truly we feel passionate about being there, about seeing them become Christ, about developing relationships, about being an incarnational witness in a place that really needs uh, to know Christ in a living way. One of the, the key hallmarks of the ministry is utilizing different avenues to multiply ourselves, uh, whether it be state conventions, churches, or college students. And every summer we host about anywhere from 10 to 15, sometimes even 20 college students. And we're placing them in cities all around us. And these college students, by spending six or eight weeks there, working alongside interning these local churches, are able to share the gospel a thousand or more times. And it's getting the gospel a lot further, a lot faster, and more impactful than we ever could. Christmas fun and all of that, 100% of what we give through Lottie Moon 
goes to support our Southern Baptist missionaries overseas, like the family that you just saw. It's also a time that we can give to the Lord through our church. We're coming near the end of 2020. And as it's been challenging, it's been a challenging year to all of us in many ways. It's been a challenging year financially for our church. And so as we come to our uh, year end, if we're able to give at the end of the, the year, let's remember to give to the Lord through our church and to give especially for the carrying of the, the gospel to others through our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And then I do want to remind you, our choir is going to be singing on Friday night at Bethlehem uh, Village. Uh, Brother Mark, I heard you say that time, six to seven, is that right? Six, okay. six, and, seven. six and seven, they're gonna sing twice. Now, if you're obviously not a part of the choir, if you're in this service, but the choir invites you, if you want to come and sing with them, they're going to be singing very familiar Christmas music. You can sing melody. You don't have to read music or sing parts. You would need to go to one rehearsal, and that's Wednesday night. And so uh, Wednesday night, there's a rehearsal. If you want to join them, they'll be glad for you to join them for that event where they're sharing the gospel through, through song. If not, you might want to go through Bethlehem Village, go out there while they're singing and just support them and worship uh, with them. Let's stand together. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We adore you. Thank you, Lord, for the work of the Spirit to sow seeds in our heart of God's love. I pray that those seeds will be growing throughout this week, throughout the year, in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.